Like right after we spoke. We're live. We're live and living color now. All right. Uh, all right. So uh, thank you, everybody. This is uh, calling the meeting to order Thursday, November 18th, 2021, uh, Oak Hills Park Authority meeting. Uh, I'll call that to order. Uh, we'll do a uh, attendance. Uh, go around. Roll call. Alan Dutton. Yeah. Uh, Ray and Bromark. Yeah. Jennifer McAllister. Here. Carl Dickens. Here. Uh, Joe Andrasco. Here. Uh, Babar Sheik. Not present. TJ Tromboli. Is not present. Uh, Denise Brown. And uh, Mike DePalma, I am present. So we have six members. So we have a quorum. Um, next up on the agenda, acceptance of the minutes. Would anybody like to move that? So moved. Any comments? So moved. Any comments? Changes? I have a lot of changes. I told you about earlier that there's a zillion on this. Okay. Um, under um, the attendance, first of all, they need to put you as chair. They need to add Carl to begin with, because he wasn't even on the attendance list. And then they have to list him as vice chair. Then they need to put for Joe and Drosco, um, treasurer. Then um, they spelled my name incorrectly. They spelled Baba's name incorrectly. They spelled um, then um, Larry Schwartz, um, Gary Crowley and Randy Avery should all go um, under the other section. Um, then TJ Tromboli actually joined the meeting at 7.04, so we have to get the time 7.04 in under him. Then we go on to the acceptance of the minutes where um, Mr. Dutton moved to accept the minutes. They need to put as amended. We did have um, changes. And then they never put who seconded the meeting, which was Jennifer McAllister. Then the Roman numeral four under public comment has to be removed. And under Mr. Brennan's section, we also need to add the sentence. He also commented on what a great job Jim and Paul are doing. Then if you go to the next page, that Roman numeral five should actually be the Roman, Roman numeral four. And then under the supporters of Oak Hills Park update, we need, um, I want to add a comma after the available saying through September 2021. Then on page three, um, under the restaurant section where you gave the report, Mike, I want to add a sentence also that zoning is currently on track for a public hearing on November 4th. Then under the golf operations report um, that Paul presented in the first paragraph after the 33.7 increase in greens fees, I also want to um, add and a 27.2% in court fees. And then under the next sentence where there are 11 outings confirmed for next year, we also need with um, to add the number four, that four more are pending. And then the next sentence where he announced this year's winners, we need to add of the various tournaments. Then the next sentence needs to be changed saying, there is a appreciation event planned for the staff. Then at the bottom under Jim Shell's section on the last paragraph, where he said he needs more than the allotted 18,000. We need to um, add a comma and is obtaining bids. And then on the last page, we need um, a dollar sign by the 600,000. And then we also need to add a paragraph or a section where he also discussed the payments to the city, the 1% and payment toward the debt balance, um, it was also mentioned about restaurant and to date what was received as payments. Then under adjournment, 
we need to have that um, motion to adjourn was from Babar and that it unanimously passed and we actually adjourned the meeting at 8.19, not 8.05. And that's all of my changes. Very good. Sounds good. No, it's, I, was, I appreciate you coming through that. Anybody else have any changes? Okay, so can I have a motion to approve the minutes as amended? Motion. A second. That was Carl that motioned. And I'll second. And Rayanne will second. And all right, all those in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Any no's? Aye. Any abstentions? Okay, the uh, motion passes. Uh, we'll open it up for public comment. Anybody in the waiting room for public comment? There's somebody, um, there is somebody uh, raising their hand. So, uh, Peter, you have the floor. The hand is up by somebody named Peter. Yep, I think he should be talking permitted. Peter. Saying that you have the ability to speak. Hey, he's not muted. At least I don't see him muted. He put his hand down, so maybe he's just uh, listening in. Give another second here. Anyone else? Uh, wish, oh, he's back. How did that sound? Oh, that sounds great. But now he's muted. See if I could unmute. I cannot unmute him, but see if you could uh, unmute him. I think he has to do it, or the city guy has to do it. Peter, you have the permission to speak. Is that you, Peter, that said that, or who said that? That was the city. Oh. Um, is that Larry? It is not. It's Anthony. Hey, Anthony. Uh, all right. Uh, Peter, if you could just see, there should be a little mute button down the bottom of your screen if you want to unmute yourself. You should be able to speak because we do see your hand up. Um, all right. Maybe he does not wish to speak. Uh, okay. Uh, this is actually my job. Yeah, one more second. It looks like someone just called in. All right. Going once. Peter's not muted okay. now, and his hand is down. Yeah, I think he I, maybe he didn't mean to raise his hand. He might be just listening. So, uh, okay, seeing no one um, asking to speak, we'll close public comment and move into the committee reports. Uh, Nature committee, Audrey. I don't see Audrey on here. Is Audrey on? Uh -huh. Audrey cannot make it, and she said uh, her, her quick comment is that there is no update now that we're getting into colder weather. There's not much to do. Awesome. They did a great job this, this the whole season. So, um, okay. Uh, supporters of Oak Hills, Jerry, how are we uh, doing? I, I have uh, nothing to report. Sounds good. Thank well, you. thank you for coming on. It's just like when Jerry was on the, on the board. Oh, see that. <laughs> <laughs> see that. Uh, Ooh, the gallery is here from. Um, all right, so uh, moving on. I know Denise is not here to provide the tennis update, but I do think one, oh, go ahead. Sorry, she, she, uh, she just emailed me earlier today. Um, the only comment that she really had was uh, just to put it out there that, that we, we did receive another several hundred dollars in, um, in donations for the tennis friends. So they've been, they've been raising quite a bit of money over these last few months. He's been a godsend on this yeah, authority. She's been awesome. So yeah, great job, Denise. Uh, the one thing I do think we should talk about, and I forwarded over the quote for the fencing. Um, you know, last week we, or last month, we had heard from the tennis player who was struck by a golf ball. And we told him, you know, we told the city we'd look into some different options. The quote that Jim was, the first quote that Jim was able to get, if you guys saw it, was $76,000. So 76,000. And then based on some conversations I had with Jim, uh, we might have another quote coming in, but this is kind of what we're looking at here. This is the type of cost it would be. I was shocked, but again, I was, I had no idea. 
Um, so we're not going to vote on anything here. I think we continue, but I do want to, and I want to talk to Denise offline about it to see if there's any other options. Um, you know, it's, she, it's, we're a democracy, so we could vote on this stuff when we, we get all the information, but 76,000 was significantly higher than I had expected. Mike, do you know if she's aware of? Yeah, I, I forwarded to everybody. Okay. Yep. Everybody received that, right? When I forwarded it over to? Yep. Got yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I just got off the floor yesterday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I know. I, said, I was going to go shock. into the netting business. <laughs> um, I don't know that I mean, can I, can I have a copy please from somebody? Yeah, I can forward it to you right now. Yep. Thank you. So, I mean, either way, even if we were to find other bids, it, this is the ballpark that we're talking about. <clears throat> so we don't have another bid. We don't yet. No, I know, uh, Jim, you said, uh, you had reached out and we're maybe looking to get one more. Yeah, I am. Uh, I know those guys are busy and it, it sounds like they're a smaller operation and we might do better with them. My, my hopes still aren't high that it's going to drop the price enough to make it feasible. I think to really be informed, I think we've got to have at least three, my yeah. personal opinion. And then I really think we got to look at it long and hard because we got some veteran members on here and Paul's been there for a long time. Jim, you've been there for a long time. I've been associated with the, with the course itself for 18 years now, to my knowledge, and Jerry, speak up if you have something. <laughs> I don't know that that's ever been a problem. And there is, there is language by the tee box and other things that seems to me we got stuff in place that we could enforce and really enforce it. I mean, it's because we got money in the bank right now. I mean, you know, obviously it comes out in these meetings, but that's ridiculous. Plus, I'm not sure aesthetically it's going to look very good. I'm with you. I, I mean, I think obviously we've got cash, but that doesn't mean we go spend it all. I do think we just continue to look. There could, you know, I'm willing to listen to other people's ideas. You know, I had thrown out the idea of maybe putting a camera on there. It would deter some people. Um, I actually was over there on Tuesday and kind of got out and walked around. I mean, it still is relatively difficult to just hit that in there on the fly. You almost have to try to do it unless it ricocheted off of something. Yeah. That being said, look, I don't want there to be any sort of danger either. So I think we just, we, we, I agree with you. We get two more quotes. We see where that pans out. Um, we, I want to sit down with Denise and the rest of the, you know, the folks from the tennis committee to just see if there's any other ideas. But $76,000 is a, a huge amount of money. And if we start, you know, I know it's, it looks like we've got a good cash on hand balance right now, but we're going into the winter. Yeah. Nothing's guaranteed. Um, there's a reason why we got to the point financially that we are is because we have been very conservative as a, uh, you know, as a, as an authority. So do we have insurance to cover any of these incidents? Uh, and if so is there a high deductible and stuff like that? Yeah, and, well, the monthly premium now is about $76,000. I'm kidding, but it's high. Our premiums have gone up quite a bit in the last few years. Yeah. Um, and they probably will continue. But uh, it, we we are covered against against uh, you know injuries to players and so forth uh, being being sued against them and so forth. How, how high is the deductible, Mark? We know. Uh, you know, I don't remember offhand. Um, I can take a look and get back to you tomorrow. Though. That's a good point. We should find that out. Yeah, I think it's rather high, but I, I have, but I'm not going to look it up. Do we know where all of that extracurricular voices are coming from? Yeah, if everybody who's not talking could just mute themselves. TV on. Everyone? Good. Whoever that was. Success. Um, so, yeah, I think we just continue to look at options throughout the offseason. You know, I want to make sure that we're addressing it as best as possible. But like I said, $76,000 floored me. Because in my mind, I was like, I have 10, 15,000 maybe, but that shows you how much I know about netting. So I was told that in the last 17 years, other than that one gentleman recently, only one person's been hit in 17 years. Yeah, I mean, I, I, it's clear that it's, it's not often. That also I doesn't mean I think we completely ignore it. I think we got to do our due diligence to say that we, you know, and it's just right. my opinion. Again, it's a democracy, so I'm open to all different kinds of ideas. But in my opinion, I think we got to do our best in within oh. reality. I, th I think the part about doing our due diligence is great. And I think we could have Randy write that up in legalese 
and I don't know, Mark, maybe we attach that to our policy just so they have it with the policy that we've really looked in this, but it's not been an issue for, what did you just say, Paul, 17 years or something like that? That's what I was told. Yeah. Well, you I, know what I, would be I, interesting? Because we could find out pretty, if we were to put a net up, I wonder if we went back to the underwriters and said, okay, does this lower our premium? Because we're taking some risk off of you. It would give us a sense of whether the insurance company thinks that that is a real risk. Mm -hmm. I don't think they would. But I think, look, if, if it is a real risk and the insurance company says, yeah, we'll, we'll lower your premium because now you are a less risky client, I think that it'd be worth asking. It's, I, it's, I there's no harm in asking. I did, but that won't happen. But if you want, I can, give a, years, get I can give a quick call to our uh, insurance agent. Just, just run this by him and see what he says. Because they and do a full... Oh, that's a new liability that we haven't yeah. been aware of. So your premium's going up 50 grand. Well, right, well <laughs> not. But so when they do the underwriting, I assume they come and walk the course, right? Mark, I mean, see uh, the condition only, of the course. Only when there's a change in our insurance provider. Um, however, when we had, we did have a change of insurance provider about a year and a half ago, right in the middle of COVID. And so because of that, they did everything via uh, phone calls and questionnaires. Yeah. And everybody, if you're not aware of it, you should realize that we've been in a high risk insurance situation for a long time. So, you know, yeah. if you're not familiar with that, that's like if you've been in an automobile accident and you were drunk, you're going into risk and that's expensive. I look at it like, yeah, $70,000 is an awful lot of money for netting. I think we've been, if it's been one incident in 17 years or whatever number of incidents, I, I think we make, we can see we were lucky, but we shouldn't, you know, put that in the bank. We should definitely see what we can do to mitigate things going forward. Um, but I do agree, like that's an astronomical amount of money. So doing due diligence and coming up with various options is probably the best way to go forward. Well, I, you, you're, you're spot on, I think. And like I said, we, there's a sign that's there. If we need to put a new sign or something that says that if you try to do this, I think, Paul, doesn't the sign say something about that you, you're suspended for a while or you can't play or something like that? Banned forever. Media suspension. Yeah, so... Uh, you know, I can tell you 10 years ago, somebody might have been able to hit it over, but it's the trees are way too tall. Anytime a ball goes on the course, it's it's deflection from the trees line in the 11th fairway. It's yeah. just, it's very difficult. I mean, you'd have to really be trying because you, you're going to have to get it in a off the tee and elevate it over 60, 70 well, foot trees. You'd also, have to use, you'd also have to use a pitching wedge or a nine iron. That's exactly it, right. Yeah. Uh, just so you know, I did look at a range and it was definitely you know, a couple, 100, 200 miles south of here, but nine poles that are over 30 feet uh, with netting was 23,000. So yeah. I know we live in the New York metro area, but if we do have to do netting, I'm sure we could get a better price than that. I, yeah, that's why I'm oh, pursuing yeah. a second price. I'm just waiting for these guys to get back to me. Yeah. Well, I think that's the plan. We, we get it, hopefully get some more quotes. Maybe they're a little bit more realistic. And think, brainstorm some more folks, talk to the tennis people, uh, the tennis committee, see if Denise has any other ideas. I do want to give, I know we closed public comment, but I feel bad because I think Peter is trying to get on and I want to, I don't want him to be, not be able to get on because of some sort of technical issue. So if we can just try one more time to let him speak. I'll open it back up if that were to work. Peter, yeah, his hand's still up and he muted himself again. Yeah. But it it, his hand keeps going up and down. Any type of any type of question, or at least let us let us know he can hear us. I don't. Uh, yeah, I think if you want Peter, if you could hear us, you could try to type something into the Q and A section, and everyone, all the panelists will be able to see it. Nobody else will be able to see it, but uh, the the authority. I don't want to hold it up well, too, too yeah, much. But. The host and the panelists can see the question. I, I don't know if he would see anything we wrote to him. Uh, we would be we would be able to answer. Um, That's true, even if he doesn't see it. Yeah. Um, so just give it another twenty seconds here. See if there's anything else, and then we'll move on. All right, the hand went down. So, uh, Peter, if you uh, you can always email me after the meeting, Mike the two five two five at hotmail dot com, and I'll try to answer whatever question or or anything that you can uh, you might have. So. Um, okay, so that is that with the tennis report. I will circle back with um, Denise, obviously. 
Uh, okay, so let's move along to item number five, GM report uh, from Don Mastronardi. Don, how are we looking? Let's... Good, everybody. Evening. Um, wanted to give out an update on the fire alarm. It's finally fixed um, after months of working on this. So the fire alarm is completely done. Good. And we went from getting quotes between seven and 10,000, thinking everything was going to have to replace, to doing it for just under four, which um, because once the panel was fixed, we found that every single fire alarm worked properly and we didn't have to swap out everything. So we actually saved a lot of money um, just out of luck only because everything was working, but that's a good saving. And now we're compliant now with the fire department. So we're good on that end. Did they come down and inspect it, Tom? They are, I reached out to the fire inspector today. Um, I'm trying to get them in here next week because we're going to have to get him down here and he's going to have to do a test. The electrician is going to do a, what's called a bleed test on the lights, which means we have to shut down the lights for like 90 minutes and just it just tests the, the exit lights. So when you shut everything down, the exit lights have to stay on for 90 minutes, which he's either going to do first thing in the morning tomorrow or he's going to do, he's going to come in after the pro shops close because we have to close the, um, or you have to keep the lights off. So. Uh, I need to coordinate with Paul to just figure out a good time for the pro shop to have that's done too. Because the exit lights are battery powered. So they'll, you know, obviously they have to have 90 minutes worth of battery. That's the whole idea behind them. Because when they power up, they have their own independent lighting. So, Correct. okay. Yep. So that's just the last, that's a simple test. It takes 90 minutes. Um, and then also I wanted to talk about, we had, uh, I had a guy come out and do um, some measuring and measuring and stuff for, the, the awnings for outside for the actual blinds. And I'm looking on getting quotes for that. So the automatic blinds like we do at Silver Mine Golf Club, which will allow us to enclose the porch and use it um, year round. So that'll help um, for restaurants and events doing bigger events and allowing us to do them in the off season. So that should help the capacity issues and um, allow us to have bigger events during the off season when it's colder outside. So that's something I'm waiting on a quote from. Um, but I think from a cost benefit analysis, I think that's kind of something that if we do it, it's going to make us money, more money in the long run for the whole park. So Don, when you do that, because um, I did something similar in Tokenique, what about heating on that area? Because it's fine just to say you can put the plastic down, et cetera, like that. But how do you warm that area, keep it hot during the middle of winter? Well, there are, I don't, know, I don't know the last time you were up here, Alan, and, or saw it, you probably didn't even recognize or notice them, but. There's uh, outdoor heaters out here, looks like, that are built in. I don't know if they work yet. I got to take a look at that. Um, so that's something we can address, but they do have auto, we do have heaters out there already. Okay. Um, that are plugged in, and I believe they're not like propane or kerosene, so it doesn't matter if you enclose them. So if it's electric, it's fine. So it's electric with a blow heater that blows them out? Yep. So that's what it looks like they are. I don't know. I'm not very good with that kind of stuff, so I gotta get somebody to look at it. Um, but I think the we're other thing, the other thing you kind of uh, skipped over was because we met on the 21st between the last meeting and now we did get that text change approved. Yeah, I was uh, gonna go over that next. Okay, sorry. Yep. No, it's okay. Uh, I just want to make sure we touched on that. Okay, yeah. go ahead. Keep going. Yeah. No. So the the awnings and everything, we're waiting on the quotes for that, or the or the actual blinds and the awnings, but. But the awnings themselves would have cost us twenty five thousand. I'm assuming this guy told me it's probably ballparking. It's probably maybe like twenty five to thirty five, right in between there, depending on um, what he comes back with. But, but doing the awnings, which is something we had to do anyway because of the sun, this will save us from having to do that because the blinds you can adjust them and they can just block the sun out as we need them, and they'll be controlled for individual panels, so they'd have separate panels for each section of the the patio. So if you had to just bring them down different sizes or lengths, you could do that. Um, as Mike mentioned before, we were able to um, get the text amendment change. It was a unanimous vote. There wasn't a single person on the call that asked a question or even brought up any concerns. Uh, and then we had to, then the city made us post the notice again in the paper, allowing there's a 15 day appeal process I have no idea why they do that, but so there's an appeal process that ends on the 25th because um, it went in the paper on the 10th. So it was 15 days. So 
Uh, we have 15 days. And then once the appeal process is done, zoning and printing will hand us the permits. We'll get the sign offs on everybody that we need to get signed off on. Health's already signed off on, so it's going to be a simple sign off from them. Fire will sign off as soon as they come test the fire alarm. And then the WPA stuff is already done. That's the, the EPA of like the city of Norwalk kind of thing. Um, and then the plumbing and electrician, uh, all they have to do is talk about the work they did and submit the, their work with the permits and then we're done. Uh, hopefully we can have that done in a couple of days. Once we get the final permits, we shouldn't be a problem as long as I can get the fire marshal in here. Um, Does the city it, have to give you a certificate of occupancy based upon all those like plumbing, electrical, fire, et cetera, once all those are done? The CO, the, the CO is basically the final step. So once you get all those sign offs, you hand them paperwork and then the C, they give you the CO. So right. all that pack, that packet has to be put together and then the CO is what comes out of that once you hand that everything in. The CO is the final part of that. How about a temp CO? What do, what's the difference between the two? What 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 gives you a full CO versus a temp CO? Uh, well, you can operate. You can operate with a temp CO for years. By the way, right? Like right. It, you know, it's not a big deal to be honest with you. Um, yeah. Once you have a temp CO, you're good to go. Um, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like your uh, it's kind of like your liquor permit. You get a, like a provisional until the real one comes in. Um, right, but whatever. what you're saying is once you get all your, your I's dotted and T's crossed with all the different inspections, they're going to hand you a full CO, correct? Yeah, you hand in the packet and then they usually right. give you the CO. So my question is, what can you do to get a temp CO that might speed up the process a little bit and get you open a little bit earlier? Or does it not matter? It's immaterial at the end of the day, timing wise. Yeah, I think, I don't think the temp CO doesn't, the temp CO you can't occupy. You can't operate unless you have all the sign offs and everything anyway. Okay. Um, Each town is different. In New York, you can operate. Yeah. This year. I don't think it's going to be an issue once we get all the sign offs, plumbing, uh -huh. electric, fire, get them all done, good to go. Health is important and, and, and you should be good to go. You know? Yep. And most of this stuff's already been done. So health's already kind of signed off because that's what we've been operating, um, doing. Um, the halfway house and everything, they kind of already signed off on everything. There wasn't, wasn't much changes for health check anyways. Um, so we're pretty set. Like I said, it's just getting the signatures. Once we get the actual permitting paperwork for them to sign off against, and then we're good to go. So again, it's just one of those things we're going to, we're going to push these guys to get it done as quick as possible so we can get this place open. So just to put some date. So if we look at the 25th is Thanksgiving, obviously. So we're losing that whole four day weekend in terms of getting anything done with the city. So that's because the city hall, I assume is closed on the 26th. So uh, the earliest... Sorry, Mike, we're reaching out to Brian in the morning and asking him if we could possibly, since the 25th is a holiday, if it would be possible to get everything on the 24th and call it a day. Cause again, I mean, it's. You may not do that. If you have to give everybody 10 full days for the appeal, they may make right. you wait till the 25th. I know it's Thanksgiving day and I know it's a right. holiday, but. Yep. Right. Yeah, yeah you gotta get plumbers and electricians. You gotta get everybody in. It's gonna be tough. You know, I wouldn't yeah. push it. Well, that's what I mean. So I'm saying realistically, we're looking at the sign-off process, all this, you know, final COs and all that stuff happening the week of the 29th. Correct. Do you have a uh, a timeline for how quickly that moves? You get the sign-offs from if you could, I mean, have you lined up the fire marshal to say, hey, Monday the 29th, you're coming in, hey, so that every one of them is teed up right now. I have, I've had a call in for over a week to get it done because we're once the fire alarm thing got done this past week. Um, so I'm waiting for the fire marshal to, to be able to come in here. I have a good relationship with Luca. I've reached out to his personal cell phone. He hasn't gotten back to me yet, but he's usually pretty good. I bet y'all hear from him tomorrow one way or the other. Um, so I can let you guys, I can shoot an email tomorrow to everybody to give me an update after I've heard. So I'm sure he'll let me know. He said he was going to let me know this week. So tomorrow is the end of the week. So um, once I have that, I'll let you guys know update. But it shouldn't be, like I said, it's it's the scheduling thing with these guys, but I don't I don't anticipate it being like a month out. Right. So so once it's open, what are your plans? Like, so say the 9th or whatever that, you know, uh, 9th or 10th of December, 
are you going to be open on the weekends? Are you going to be open for private parties? Are you going to be open? Like, what does that look like? Because there's nothing, you know, we don't have any, it's nothing in the agreement that says you have to be open, but obviously yep. after all the time we want to be open. So what does that look like? So what I'm thinking to doing for, to start us out, to get us through uh, December, January, February, and March, uh, or at least to the end of February is doing um, dinners from Thursday night through Sunday night with brunch on Sunday. So we'd be open all day Sunday so we can get that football crowd Mm -hmm. um, and then do dinners uh, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday nights. I just don't anticipate um, the lunch business being um, worthwhile to be open when there's not a lot of golf traffic. I'm just going by what dry dock lunches are, what we're on Main Street. Um, Lunches have been down across the board um for us since covid and a lot of my other restaurant friends i've talked to said that, re- that a lot of them don't even open till three o'clock because the lunch business just hasn't been there because yeah. everybody's working from home so i think for us it makes sense to do dinners and events with bands and karaoke and stuff like that that we're planning already and starting to fill a schedule with julie's starting to look into booking bands and that kind of stuff so i think with events and that kind of thing i think we can make this place do well enough through these months from Thursday through Sunday to get us through to the golf season and then open for lunch uh, mid-March or maybe end of March, early April. That, that's what I would I anticipate the game plan being. So, Don, the people coming won't be golfers, okay, because it's, it's too cold and whatever. The only people that the golfers would be coming if they wanted to grab a beer, yep. uh, something like that which is something we might want to talk about. So, you know, you're opening up the place. It's going to be a, it's a great view and stuff like that. Obviously we need a sign now, basically to let people know outside, I think, you know, Um, obviously the ability to, to, to contact, you know, the 2200 people that you have used the, we have their email addresses, you know, just to let them know you're there and stuff like that. I think yeah. to start a little bit of marketing, you know, would be would be to your advantage, I think, you know? You know, we're, we're working on that now. That's what Julie and I were doing here all day today. We're working on the marketing package, getting that ready to go, getting the website done. Um, we got the menus done. Um, we wanted to start uh, really plastering on Facebook and stuff. I just, I, I just want to, I'm trying to, I want to get that set date so we have the date in hand so we can really pump it out. Because I feel like we keep saying coming soon, and then we, we kind of just kind of keep pushing. So I'm waiting. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm, I'm hoping tomorrow we'll have a little more timing on when we'll actually have this permit, if we can get it earlier. So we're going to talk to Brian first thing in the morning. Hopefully he'll – hopefully they'll give us that that day grace period, and hopefully maybe on Friday we can get, you know, at least the plumbing and electrical and maybe uh, if the fire marshal can get in here um early next week we can have that all ready to go that's the kind of goal and then what we want to do is do if we could do a soft opening we could i want to do a test menu um dinner with select like you guys you guys bring your your wives and kids we can do like a a set dinner kind of soft opening where it's not open to the public but it's open to friends and family kind of thing so we can do a test of the menu get feedback what works what doesn't work and then hopefully my goal is to be open that that following Thursday. So, so Don, I would just say, I think it's a great opportunity. I think if you can make it anything that's slightly unique to Oak Hills, I think it needs to be, if it, it's possible, a little different than just, it can't be dry dock too, I don't think. I mean, it's got to be very similar and obviously a lot of your dishes, but if we can think about anything, two or three maybe special dishes just for like Oak Hills that make us a bit different or... Yep. You know, and then obviously when the season opens, that's a different deal. You know, there's different markets there. There's the golfers and, and then there's the trade that comes for dinner and stuff. So, but I think for now, um, you know, it's something a little bit different from what you do at Dry Dock um, would be a good idea just from, I think, my point of view. Yeah, and that's what we've done with the dinner. So, for example, we're doing, I'll just give you guys a couple of these stuff that we're doing on the menu that we don't do at Dry Dock. Like we're doing a Southern style shrimp and grits that we've never done at any of the restaurants that we think will be really popular for mm-hmm, mm-hmm. to kind of go with the barbecue theme that we want to start in the spring uh, with the cost of pricing on meats and stuff right now. I'm trying to stay away from steak and that kind of stuff, just because the pricing is so high on it. And I'm hoping maybe in the new year, it'll come down a little bit. 
who knows though with inflation and everything the way it is but uh we're putting short ribs on the menu we're putting um a, a pork chop scorpiello that we don't really do at dry dock we're doing a chipino we're doing uh, mussels and clams uh because seafood is believe it or not is actually not too crazy in pricing it hasn't really jumped that much um but we are going to have specific um like for example we'll be doing a braised uh beef or smoked brisket uh grilled cheese starting in the spring because we're gonna have a smoker in here so we're gonna be doing a lot of that barbecue theme where you don't have a lot of barbecue in this area i mean when you think of barbecue you're thinking of hoodoo, hoodoo browns which is out close to danbury so it's kind of a trek so we're trying to draw people in with some really good barbecue um and then obviously having some really good dinner options like uh some cod uh parmesan encrusted cod that we're doing so i think there's going to be some unique items on here that people will like mm -hmm. um but again, we're going to have some staples too. Don't forget, there's a there is a big vegan market out there as well. I know it doesn't go with, you know, but a lot of people are starting to eat a lot more healthily, and and, and I think that's that's a, th a thing we need to look at as well, Don. You know, on the vegan side. Yeah, we're doing a chickpea and uh, spinach salad, which was something new that we've come up with that we think mm -hmm. people are going to like. Because mm -hmm. Julie's <laughs> Julie's uh, has a very restricted diet for herself because she's um, got celiacs, so. She keeps yeah, pushing gluten, me. Yeah, gluten-free and uh, all that yeah. stuff. Yeah. yeah, she's been pushing me a lot because it's like a big change for me because I'm trying to appeal to the masses and sometimes it's it's kind of hard with that stuff because it's very specific for certain people. But we definitely have some of those options on the menu. And then the brunch is something that I really want to set us apart with because nobody does this anymore. But I would really like brunch for this place to be the brunch destination for Norwalk and in the surrounding area. Um, I think with what we want to do, I want to do some carving stations, uh, you know, like a pasta station where you come in a brunch and you kind of have some different stations you can go to and you do like the bottom of samosas and sangrias and stuff like that. And maybe have an acoustic person out here. I really want to make this place the premier brunch spot to come to too, because you got a great setting here, especially in, in the, in the spring and summer. So, if we can do that i think that'll help us draw a lot of crowd in here too now to that to, to that degree what you just said uh and mike and i had a brief conversation about the day and at some point some selected folks i think we need to have that and it goes along with oh, what you're talking about about marketing this, that, and the other thing um we've got a plan we got at least be a quarter or a half a year ahead on special days for example, we just had Veterans Day. And if we'd have been open, it would have been great to have some kind of special Veterans Day lunch, a theme. I mean, about the golf at 50%, to my knowledge, nobody knew about that to the morning of the 11th. Yep. Because I got a lot of phone calls on it. Because, you know, we could have, particularly now, we could have had veterans play for free. Easy to prove if you're a veteran. All you got to do is show your DD-214 card. So it's not a hard you to come up with uh and i would say and, and jerry again you you know this you could jump in here there's a large contingent of our clientele that plays all the time that is veterans so i just think that there's opportunities i realize we're, we're not full in sync yet but uh those are things we need to take a look at and i'll i'll close with one and a half other things the norwalk band as some of you may know, it's huge in this town. And it's got a lot of people that support them, both the students, both the parents and so on and so forth. I've gotten a request to find out on a day and the day I've used thus far was the December 9th day, uh, not locked in stone. But they have an ensemble that's a jazz ensemble that's looking at a place to play. And they would like to have it at Oak Hills. Um, that would be good marketing because it's going to touch a lot of people and they would get to eat there for many of them probably for the first time and know what anything looks like there. So it's just something to keep in mind. And Don, you and I can talk about that more if you want. I'll give you the contact or the contact you or whatever. But yeah, I'm all, I'm all for, we do this at Dry Dock too. I'm all for giving discounts to first responders, veterans, that kind of stuff. I'm big on supporting that. Um, 
I even think it'd be a good idea to do it for teachers as well. Again, it's just one of those things where. Yeah, I agree. You do well, that. One of our biggest members is president of, of the teachers union here. So. Yeah, I just think it's it, it, not only is it goodwill, it's um, teachers would be your big of the advocates to parents and, mm -hmm. and that kind of stuff. So I, I have no problem doing that. I really I want to do those kind of things and we'll do those kind of things. Uh, we'll set up the pricing accordingly. We'll have discount buttons in there. Obviously, we'll do it for the staff up here as well. There'll sure. be discounts for staff. Sure. Um, it's something like, you know, like I said, I want to build this place to be the premier place for events and, and people to come to have a good time and, and really. Well, we've it. got a, I'm sorry, we've got a lot of people to jump over and, and get them to reorient themselves to a really nice place up there because we haven't had that for years. And, yeah, and I, I think once people start seeing what we have here and what it looks like and the food, I think people will be happy. And I think to Alan's point about having some stuff on the menu that's a little different, um, that's definitely something that that we are uh, we have on the menu to to draw that in too. Um, yeah. Because most people are creatures of habit. When you go to a place, you're going to a place for certain things. Yep. You know, you, if you're going to Dry Dock, you usually you want to go because you want to go to Burger. Um, you know, if you want. You go to, you know, I don't know, Blind Rhino or whatever. You're going down there because they have really good wings. Um, there's just certain things you go to certain places for. Yep. Um, just, just in the, and I don't want to cut you off, but just in the interest of time, um, you know, I think the update on where we stand, we've got some dates finally in place. Um, I, and I don't want to go through menu options and everything on the yeah. call. But like I said, I want to make sure, so. too, that we have everybody on this call that, that we do this soft opening, which I want to do. Maybe that first weekend that we were talking about before the third uh, or fourth, um, have everybody come in and we'll have everybody do a seating. We'll do it like we're open, but it'll be for like yeah. special invite kind of thing. I think that would, yeah, that would answer a lot of these questions. So that'd be good. Yep. Um, does anybody else have anything else for Don while we have them? All right. Thank you, Don. You're welcome, guys. Appreciate Thanks, it. Thank All right. You. On to uh, golf operations report uh, from Paul. Paul. Thank you. Uh, so, you know, as the leaves begin to fall here and the men's and women's golf events have been completed for the season, uh, golf season's kind of coming to a close. And I've been happy with the golf season here. Uh, we've had a lot of play. Um, COVID-19 has definitely benefited the game of golf, the golf business, and Oak Hills Park. And we are still experiencing a high retention rate in the game, as I had a feeling we would. Um, and that means that uh, golf rounds really haven't decreased that much. And many of the new players who were brought into the game are still continuing to play. So uh, myself and other professionals, we still feel really good about 22, 2022 coming up. Uh, so the last 30 days, we've seen some good play at Oak Hills. Uh, the weather's been pretty good. Uh, there's been some warm temperatures, um, you know, and as the sunlight has diminished, we can still see some new faces uh, coming to Oak Hills Park. And through some early uh, weekday sales and specials or some afternoon golf specials, I've been trying to keep the tee sheet full and encouraging golfers to come play uh, for the final weeks of the season. Uh, our clinics have ended, but we still continue to give a lot of small group lessons and individual lessons. And uh, we are presently cleaning out the old golf shop and we have a golf net in there, a Foresight golf computer, and a monitor in there that we can be ready to give some uh, off-season golf lessons and instruction. Uh, presently, our staff, uh, from a high of about 32 in the summer, we have about 21 now at Oak Hills. Uh, our daily hours of operating are pretty much between seven and eight hours a day, down from a high of about 15 in the peak summer. Uh, we had a really nice staff appreciation event uh, last at the end of the month where 25 of our staff members participated, played golf, and we had a nice dinner. Uh, our mayor, Harry uh, Rilling, showed up, and he, as well as Alan Dutton, and they both gave some really nice, kind words of support, uh, appreciation, and thanks to our staff. And I will tell you that that really did mean a lot to them, um, thanking them for a lot of their hard work and efforts, you know, during a really busy season. 
Um, and then I also want to thank JB's Deli, who was kind enough to donate all the food to us, which, you know, I asked him not to do that, but he insisted. Um, so the last few weeks, I've been having some golf shop sales, trying to reduce the inventory. Uh, I've been working on the 2022 outing schedule and playing a little golf myself. Uh, we gained two new outings recently to Oak Hills for next year. And at the moment, uh, we're still waiting for some deposits and obviously some confirmations. But we have a 15 events scheduled for next year, and I think we'll get some more. Um, August is fairly open. I'm sure we'll secure some dates for there. Um, I've also met with the ladies, Oak Hills Women's Golf Association, to go over the 22 season. And uh, we're going to do a few new things with them. And uh, they're very organized, so that was kind of good to get that out of the way. Um, we've also negotiated a new contract with Golf Now, and that's going to give us an upgraded POS system, uh, a new tee sheet, which is much needed, a modern tee sheet with a software, and they're giving us all the hardware and all the components. And it's really no cost at Oak Hills Park whatsoever. Um, we just give them some tee times, and um, obviously Golf Now is huge. Um, so that's been pretty good for us, uh, but it's going to make things a lot easier in the golf shop and a lot easier for the staff as well, and probably much more financially beneficial to Oak Hills. Um, also, hey, Paul, yes. hey, Paul, do you do you already have you already have a signed contract? No, I didn't sign it yet, but okay, okay. Yeah. Once you do, just just, uh, just if you don't mind, give me a copy, please. Yeah, great. Thanks. Uh, another new thing that could be great for Oak Hills. I don't know many of you have known this, but Oak Hills has always been part of the Connecticut State Golf Association. We're one of the few clubs in the area um, that's part of the Connecticut State Golf Association, uh, pretty much in Fairfield County. Um, and I hope that we can become part of the Metropolitan Golf Association next year it would be a huge benefit to Oak Hills. That would be um, great. One of the best golf associations in the world. And they, they, there's really a lot they could do for us. And our members could also go play many other clubs uh, in the Metropolitan Golf area. Um, uh, other than that, our, you know, our greens have been really in great shape. I hear a lot of good talk. That's keeping golfers coming to the club. And I think as uh, temperatures kind of remain, you know, 42, 45 and up with no rain, we'll still see some golfers. Uh, our golf cart fleet is looking as good as it did the day we got it last year. So it's all ready to go for next season. And uh, I just anticipate 2022 to be another great year for Oak Hills. Even if there are shortages in products, which I experienced a little bit, uh, staffing, you know, not always easy or su supply chain difficulties. But I think with a functioning restaurant uh, to help accommodate the damp demand for golf and help facilitate golf events at Oak Hills, uh, I really look forward to another prosperous and successful year for everybody at Oak Hills Park. And that's it, unless anyone has any questions. Uh, I have a, a couple questions. Uh, mm -hmm. One on that, I think it was the updated POS system you'd met, or um, uh, you mentioned giving, you're going to give them a few rounds of golf. Is that like a, no, the way they work and obviously they're a, a monopoly. They're a huge company in the United States, if not the world. And they just barter trade times. They call it uh, to, for the use of their system. So it's at no cost. And typically every golf course just gives them a couple tee times. And it's pretty, pretty much a barter. I know it's, we it's, what's, it's what's currently in place right now with Easy Lane. Yeah, we've been so there's using them for right. years, and yeah. you know our our uh, computers there are a little archaic, and is and it's also a system that we're using that they are phasing out. So we really have no choice. But I know it'll with uh, some of the tutorials we've done with them, it's going to make things a lot better for us. Yeah, I mean, I I trust you know the the going with them. Um, just one of the things we talked about was getting rid of any kind of bartering altogether. One of the things that came from the city. And in my opinion too, if this is something where it sounds like it's just the way that this company operates, Mark, I would just say, because I'm sure the city's going to ask for it and rightly so, we got to be able to track those bartering costs. Because if, we, if it would have been around that we would have paid $2.05 to the city, we need to figure out a way to include that. It doesn't sound like a lot, but it is something that the city DT asked me about last month. Um, so we have to be able to, to track that because if that was around that they should have gotten, I don't know. It's just, I want to just put it on the record on that. Well, I, I think it's more about these season passes that- uh... well, No, they were asked, they specifically asked about bartering rounds. There's an email thread where I'd asked for a detail on all the different barters. 
And there wasn't many, but we just don't want to get in the habit of, okay, this guy's going to do some work at the halfway house. So yeah. we'll barter some rounds and then there's no way to track it. it. You know, so it sounds like this is kind of a unique case because that's how that's literally their business model. Is that what you're saying? Oh, yeah. So this isn't just like a contractor that we're saying, Hey, do some work. We'll give you some free rounds. I just want to make sure that when I go in front of the BET next month and they hear that we're, there's some bartered rounds, I could rightly speak to, okay, well, what does that mean towards our repayment to the city? So it, it, probably an offline conversation. We're only talking about a couple of dollars, but I just don't want to get in the habit of, you know, I want this stuff to be tracked. So we have it. Does that make sense, Mark? It does. And, and just real quick, the, 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 the quick answer is that, yeah, this is, this is a reduction in revenue versus a, 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 an actual expense. So it would be something. It would not be something that we would ever pay the city on. This, the, we're, we're, it's, it's, it's a, it's an, it's an, it's an expense at the end of the day. But the other part of it, yes, with the barters, I, I that's fine if we want to do away with those. I just think it's would be so much easier. I'd rather pay an extra couple hundred dollars than do a deal with the bartering and not knowing and you know. It, it, so it's another conversation. The other thing is, um, Paul, at the last meeting when we were talking, and I, I think you might have quasi answered it when we were talking about the tennis netting, but. One of the questions that the gentleman from the public who was hit asked was, was that particular golfer banned? And then have we had anybody else banned for cutting the corner? It sounded like you did some research on it and there was only one other incident that you were able to find, but I want to put words in your mouth. So do you have updates on that? Have we were able to find any records of anybody being banned and what the repercussions were to the gentleman that hit the ball? Well, I've been there 10 years. And I mean, really, that's the first time I've heard of anyone getting hit by a ball. And then some of the people who've been there longer said they might have heard of one person in the past. Uh, but, you know, the, uh, when the gentleman did get hit, I mean, we sent, our, we sent some, a ranger over and we had a long talk and everything was fine. And people were, you know, they were nice to each other and nobody was really angry or upset. And uh, so at that time, I mean. So the policy know. is if it's somebody's caught intentionally cutting the corner. Correct. Yeah, so I, we I really don't think. Yeah, I don't think anyone has intentionally cut that corner at all this year. It's just, it's, you can't hit it over those trees anymore. They're too tall. But even if they try, Paul, right, there's a sign out there that says you will be kicked off the course, right? Yeah. Yeah. I believe it's, I believe the policy is if you're caught intentionally doing it, we can ban you from the course. Yeah. And Correct. obviously the problem is how do you prove that somebody was intentionally trying to do it? Um, I think somebody taking out a driver would be the only way. I mean, who's, I mean, but even that to, to hit a driver and land it in there is a pretty skillful shot to be able to. No, do. it's, I couldn't do that. It has to hit a tree and go dead left. Yeah. yeah. Right. We still want to make sure. So that's why it, this goes to the larger point of how we're going to address this, even though it's rare. Um, it still is something that we have to be able to have, you know, and I don't know how to define that. I mean, if somebody shanks a ball, do they get banned for life? I don't want them to. Well, when, sorry to interrupt there, but when, when's the last time, and we I had these conversations for that too, when's the last time we really re-educated the people that play there, particularly people that play there a lot, to what the rules of Oak Hills are? Everybody thinks they know what they are. But it should be reiterated, should be overseen by you, Paul, and then it should be posted on the website, and there should be a list of rules right at the terminals, uh, maybe even at the halfway house or whatever, but people should know the rules. And, and I'm not sure that most of the people that play there do because they played there for so long. It even pops up on the golf court itself, the cart itself, doesn't it say yep. that's cutting the, the corner? Uh, on, the, on the vid screen, yes. On the vid screen, it's saying, you know. Particularly as you approach like certain holes, particularly that one. Mm -hmm. Right. I think if something like this happens again, that the board needs to, to do a thorough investigation, put someone from the board or someone in charge of it and have them interview people, <clears throat> produce a report, give it to us so we can discuss it and then take the, take the actions further. You know, so it's, it's, it's documented and minuted as yep. to what we've done. Yep. That's a good idea. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I know we got yeah, a and, and, detailed and, email from Don and Paul right after the incident. That, but that's you know, not the time to talk to somebody. No, no, I'm saying at least we were kept abreast because the email, <laughs> I went back and looked and it did say that both parties were immediately, you know, spoken with, that the uh, gentleman was very apologetic. Um, so we do have documentation from right after the incident. 
Um, but I agree, it's, we, that sh we shouldn't have stopped there. We formalize it a bit, you know, do an investigation, do a task, you know, just whatever it is. I think it would just be I, a bit more weight to it. I would ask your opinion, Al, and Paul, yours. Seems to me there should be, as most you call a private club or not, and I'm not calling it because a private club. Yep. It is highly used. Most places have a rules committee. And so, yeah. and, and so to your point, and I 100% agree with it, if there is an incident that occurs, then it's brought before the rules committee. And if the rules committee decides that they need to talk to somebody that's involved in that, that's their purview also. Then the whole board can meet and talk about it. But, you know, and I learned a long time ago, when you have a situation like this, you don't go talk to the person that's involved in it at that very moment because they're not getting up from being shocked in the head, if that's the case, and start thinking about what their course of action is. It's not that they tell several other people, this is what happened to me, that an idea starts to form with the person, and God knows where that can go. I like the idea of a rules committee and a formalized process for these. It could be for but beyond just something like that particular hole. Yeah, it could be somebody going yeah. doing donuts. Oh, it's for something. everything. Yeah. 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 Bring the clubs that want to call the house course. committee and the house, yeah, the house committee, it doesn't have to be us. It could be other sort of people and the house committee looks at all disciplinary items and stuff like yes. that. Yes. Services. Yeah. I mean, we got people that, I mean, what, a year or so ago, we had somebody try to drive a golf cart across the ditch between 16 and 17. Uh, of course it doesn't work. Uh, yeah. And okay. So, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of stuff that happens. People bring booze onto the course. They're not allowed to do that. Uh, so, yes, a whole whole bunch of stuff. I, I actually caught people um, trying to walk on the golf course on hole 14 one day just without paying. Yep, yeah. that happens a lot, too. Yes, you're right. So if anybody wants to is an, interested in being a member of this committee, if you want to send me an email um, and maybe we could put the committee together. We'll just have it. And then the next meeting, we could announce that committee and moving forward, put a more formalized process so that. Well, there's a member on this board that I would nominate and I'll, I'll send you a note. Okay. Um, all right, cool. Anything else for Paul before we move on? We're running pretty late on time here, so. All right, thanks, Paul. Great job this year. Yeah, thank you. All right, financial report with Mark which I guess we could roll into the preliminary discussions, which is the new business. But uh, go ahead, Mark. Uh, I think you just jumped over Jim. Well, Jim Shell, course maintenance report with Jim Shell. How are we doing, Jim? Dang it, Mark, you spoiled it. <laughs> oh, you're getting out easy. All's good. Uh, we're in the middle of the war with the leaves. It's a uh, pain in the butt. It's not my favorite time of year. But there's really uh, not much to report tonight. It's pretty uneventful around here, other than... You know, I've been trying to get in contact with the pavers, email, phone call, no response. Um, we have to start thinking about at some point, you know, we got to ask them not to even start. And hopefully they'll be available in the spring when the plants open up. Uh, so that's something to think about on the side. Uh, let's see. The heavy rains have... Uh, this season that we've had multiple multi-inch storms uh they've exposed some weaknesses in some uh roofing and flashing systems the stone house ended up with water coming into the dining room oh. so the paint is peeling off of that wall and we're gonna have to rip it out and likely put a new one in and the now don't get mad the starters building, the old pro shop building, which had a complete new roof put on. Mm -hmm. The flashing around the chimney was never done. It had a pretty good leak to it when we had one of those heavy storms and they came out today to fix that. Hopefully that is taken care of. And I think that they were both leaks that would only come about with those massive rains that we had this year. So uh, fingers crossed. How concerned should we be about this this paving contractor? I mean, at this point, it, it's... I don't know. I mean, last time I spoke to him, when they were here and we drove around and refreshed the ideas of what we're doing, uh, they were still confident that when they get here the third week of November that they were going to finish. But I just, I don't know how it's possible. 
You know, they're yeah, going to like the fact that you said they don't return. They're not returning your phone calls or staying in contact with you. No, they're not. And it's kind of upsetting. You know, all he's got to do is say, all right, here's where we stand. This is the potential date. If we get delayed by weather, then it's going to move to this date. And they haven't done that. So I don't know what, uh, you know. Jim, who's the main person at the city you deal with? Is it Anthony? With the Anthony city? Or who else? Yeah, with the city. When you have to talk uh, to Anthony, I don't deal to much with the city. I mean, the, the biggest, the most I, person that I've had contact with the most is Chris Torrey, the, uh, the superintendent of public works. Okay. The, the reason I ask is that I know that they have huge contracts with this city. Yeah. And I may not feel we have any clout. You know, to, to get them to talk to you, which they need to do. But right. if somebody at the city leaned on them a little bit and said, hey, by the way, this work that you're doing for the golf course is also work that you're doing for us. You can't just not answer Jim's questions and get back to him and keep him filled in and, and stay to the timeline. And maybe that'll get their attention. I don't know. Well, Jim, I can try that route. I had a discussion with the... Uh with Chris today and uh, it was about uh, something that's controversial here at Oak Hills and I'm sure you're all guessing right now what it is. And he won't do it for me. He won't mark the trees for me. He wants to have the meeting with the group. He marked of, the trees that needs to come down or turn yes, or whatever? Yes, yeah. so the process is not what it used to be, I guess. I. I, yeah. I don't know what to do there either. I've, I've been thinking about it all day because it was an upsetting phone call. And uh, we got into it a little bit. But at the end of the phone call, you know, we were fine. But uh, I just don't know where to go right now. Well, I, I can, without, be, without being able to remove some trees, I, I can't make improvements in certain spots. Yeah. It's just not worth it. I don't need to run this longer, but you and I and whoever else wants to, but we could do this offline. Uh, yep. Because it's just a couple, you know, where we can apply muscle, we can apply muscle. The, the and there are, places that, there are places that we can do that. And Mike, you know where they are as well as I do. So the RFP states the work may commence October 12th and shall be completed no later than December 10th. That's the yeah. RFP. That's the line. Unfortunately, language. we did not put a penalty in there. Yeah, but he put a penalty that if, we, if this job goes until next year, he can charge us more, correct? That's, right. it's, that's, it's, that's it's why I'm saying at some point we got to make a decision. When is it past the point that we think that they're going to be able to finish? I think that's coming up pretty soon. I do Negotiation too. can go both ways too. I mean, look, if we, we, I don't know what the option is at this point. If we just, if they don't, if they don't abide by what this RFP said, right. And they, it, you're exactly right, Jennifer. It says it's very clear that if it's not done within the year, that, they, that the prices can be renegotiated. It doesn't mean that that needs to go in their direction. So if we come back and say, you guys bid on a project where it was a firm deadline as to when this project needed to be done, and yep. you went quiet on us, and now it, we're in the middle of November, right around Thanksgiving, and you haven't even started work. Um, I mean, I know they came in much lower than other bidders, but it doesn't matter how cheap you are, how inexpensive you are if you don't actually do the work. So, um, I would hold that. I mean, I would definitely let them know this was no, no, through no fault of, of us, through no fault of weather. There's no excuse no. for them not working on this. I agree. And I, and I don't like the fact that, you know, that it's Jim's doing all this and he negotiates with them and then they ignore it. I mean, I know. And we, I, like, I know. I don't that, like to be ignored by anybody. So, I mean, I don't want anybody ignoring you. It, right. Yeah, and I know Jim's doing they, his best. Are they in Norwalk or they, where are they? Where they are, are they? in Norwalk, yes. They're in Norwalk. I go and knock on the I'll go and knock on the door. <laughs> I don't know. That is an, no seriously. That's a good option. I yeah. know where they are. I, maybe I can do that tomorrow. I I would appreciate it. Yep. Because if you if you know if if you want to put it off to one day next week, and you want a couple of people to go with you, I'll go with you, just to give you support. So Here's I mean, my fear: Thanksgiving. I, I just know from my past life. Once it's that once Thanksgiving hits to New Year's, nothing's getting done. That's about right. Yeah, absolutely nothing. Whether it's construction, whatever, whatever it is, yep. hiring, everybody kind of seems to check out right at Thanksgiving. So at this point, even if you got someone to do the job, I can't see 
it being finished in two, three weeks. Yeah, no, I, I oh, agree. We would be able to switch. In, yeah. in my past life, and Michael, you might do this, and I'll probably do it too. You know, we'd, we'd take a look at when it got close to Thanksgiving and count out on the calendar the number of weeks that we really had left to work. Right. And that doesn't mean us. It just means how this is the number of days we got left to close bids. And uh, I'm sure everybody else does. And I, and I agree with you. I think you're absolutely right. Well, yeah, keep uh, if you could shoot us an email tomorrow, Jim, see, I'd be a yep, I'm gonna that. keep trying, you know, so okay. I will, um, uh, otherwise, I have nothing else to report unless anybody has any questions or anything. I, I, have, I have one request of you, okay? Would you take a look at the house that you live in? That's what you're referring to as the stone house, right? Yep, and give us or shoot to Michael or actually to Mark, whoever. Let's get a actual or a good bid of what it's going to take to bring your house up to snuff. And I mean, fix everything professionally that needs it. It doesn't have to fall on you. And, and Ed took his hammer and nails and stuff and went south. And you can, you can put handcuffs on Paul so that he doesn't get in. And let's find out what it would cost to bring your home up to speed because i know that there's been a lot of things that's been wrong with that house for a long time yeah uh and let's just get them fixed so you know you shouldn't have to live in, in, in a house that uh could possibly be judged inhabitable if a health inspector went out there and i'm not talking about you personally or the family or your wife or anything i'm talking about the structure okay okay yep because if we're going to make a move on it, Mark knows better than us and Joe does too. Now would be the time to, to get those things lined up and say, okay, this is an expense we need to make sure our superintendent is living in the kind of quarters that he should be living in. Okay, great. Will do. Thanks, Jim. Thank you. All right, now we're on to uh, Mark, financial report. All right, I actually wrote up quite a bit, but in the interest of time, I'm gonna to try to uh, abbreviate real quick. Uh, just general notes, the audit is officially completed and I just received the audit report a couple of hours ago, which was great. Uh, we passed you know, with flying colors. Um, we're gonna renew our line of credit. Now that I have that, I'm gonna, uh, I'll probably send a note to our bank VP tomorrow to get that set up because they need the audit report for that. I'm also gonna send the audit report on to the city and um, I guess I'll send it out to the entire authority as well. Uh, I'll be working with Joe on a high level prelim budget for the FY23 year uh, during December as well. So that's coming up for me. Uh, for October, for the financial activity. Hey, Mark, um, just, yeah. just, it's not just me, it's also, you know, include Jennifer and, and Denise. Uh, yes, sorry, yes, the finance committee. Yep. Um, financial activity through October. Uh, we had a cash balance uh, of, sorry, getting old now, gotta adjust my glasses, uh, $646,000 at the end of October, um, which means cash went up about $35,000 during the month. Now that's very important um, because historically, other than last year, uh, which obviously was an anomaly, it was a pandemic year where we saw astronomical uh, revenue, uh, cash balance, has gone down during October. I look back through 20, an extra five years, through 2015, uh, roughly $40,000 most years what we're going down. And now we're seeing go up nearly 40,000. That's almost an $80,000 swing. Um, so it's, it's a great, you know, it's great seeing that the question is, are we seeing a new trend here with, with uh, more October play? It's probably a little bit too early to see. Um, you know, it, was it just good weather? Was it still COVID restrictions? Um, are we that good? You know, I don't know, um, but it is definitely a great sign. Uh, so I won't come as a, a big surprise that uh, October numbers look great, both uh, versus last year and, and budget. We actually beat budget and prior year. We beat last year's October, which I would have put money down. We were not too during a COVID year. So uh, looking really good. Uh, the, the quick quick notes then is just Year-to-date revenue, uh, October really helped bring us nicely over budget, uh, which which Golfies was was uh, driving that. So more rounds uh, and plus at higher rates equals more golf revenue. Uh, on the year-to-date expense side, 
Uh, we're down a flat in most categories. Um, in general, I think all of, I, yeah, I just want to give a little shout out here. I think all of management is doing a great job of managing the budget, um, you know, keeping wage and material costs down. Usually, you know, we have to do that crack down when, when, our, when our revenues are down, but here we have a case with revenues up and expenses down. So uh, year to date numbers are, are looking uh, very good. Uh, we ended with $108,000 over budget on our net operating income. But as we've discussed every month so far, uh, you got to keep in mind when you remove the, go the, the golf cart capital lease reclass effect that we've discussed, uh, our true overage becomes $52,000, which is still a, a, a very good number. You know, uh, when it comes to rounds, we, we were 900 rounds over budget for the month of October alone, uh, which brings us to year to date revenue rounds of 20,325. Uh, so we're, we're over budget on rounds. Uh, and just so everyone has a, a good feel of how we're doing, we have total rounds that includes all the non-revenues, fiscal year to date through October, 24,400 rounds. And in 2019, 2018, we had about $19,000 or under. So that's five and a half to 6,000 rounds higher than just a couple of years ago. Um, and also real quick, just two years ago, we borrowed our first $10,000 from our line of credit on November 21st, it's three days from now. And now I just reported that we have over $600,000 in the bank. So um, obviously two years is huge, huge difference. And lastly, uh, we paid $45,000 to the city uh, in, in debt repayments uh, for, for the past four months. And I'm gonna be making that annual 1% repayment now that I have the audit report. Uh, Joe, I'll keep you in, in, in the loop. Uh, I'll send a note to the city tomorrow uh, when I send them the audit report and, uh, and give them the, uh, the number that I'm gonna be sending uh, as a check in the mail. And on that topic, um, you know, given the conversations that have been had with the Finance Committee of the Common Council and the BET, um, you know, I don't think it requires any authorization, but I'd like to um, start paying uh, the regular $2.05 rate for non-revenue rounds as well. This is kind of, you know, a, a difference in interpretation of the contract. It's not particularly material money to our income statement. It gets us out of the loan a little bit quicker. Although, you know, it, we're throwing $20,000 a year at a $2 million balance. Um, and, you know, I, just, I, I think it's the right way to do, go. The, the fact that there's barter rounds in there as well as season pass rounds, relatively relevant. Um, some of the analysis that Mark, you'll bring us through later um, kind of shows that that isn't as impactful as we would have thought in the past. Um, certainly not the first time we did season passes, there was a deep, deep discount and there was a better reason to not include that but with the price adjustments that we've made this year to season passes, this past year to season passes, I think that's come back up closer to par and with regular revenue rounds, uh, regular greens fees rounds. And so I, I think a lot of the um, reasons that we've had historically to not include those um, have kind of faded away. So what that would look like is a one-time true up retroactive to July 1st, so July, August, September, and October. Um, and then November onward, our BAU would just be whatever rounds we got, uh, pay the city $2.05 per round for the rest of this fiscal year. Well, so I, 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 had thought, I had thought it was gonna be only for the season passes. So you're saying all non-revenue rounds so even on, so industry standard also is, you know, if, if another uh, golf pro comes into play, we, we comp them. So we receive zero money and you're, you're saying you still want to pay the 205 on that? I suppose if there's truly no revenue associated with a round, then no. But I wasn't aware of that granularity of tracking. Maybe I am aware of it and I just forgot. But um, if we do have that granularity of tracking, yeah, I think we should probably take them out. It makes very little sense to and, and, do the $2 and as you rounds said, it, or the $0 rounds at that level right and as you said it's not it's not it's, this is not a big number at all i just just I just conceptually i i'd rather not pay uh, on on comp rounds 
Sure. So what, 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 what will be the dollar hit on that then, Joe, Mark? And what are we talking about from what, July until now? What, what, extra well, for, us, for, for the extra hit? For any 12 month period, I think we've been doing somewhere eight and a half, 9,000 season pass rounds, Mark. Is that about right? On, on our calendar year to date, we've got uh, just about 5,300 through 5,300 uh, season pass rounds. Yeah. And all, the, the, another 2,200 in barters and 426 in comps for 10 months. And, but the barters are going away. And so the season pass is really the, the main thing in play here. And it's two dollars and five cents per round, right? So that's 11 grand. I think July through now is the heavy time. You know, April, May, June is just fewer months, but it's also April. So, you know, I think you I think we get to about nine thousand season pass rounds in a year. So figure I'm wrong by a factor of, I don't know, a couple of percentage points. It's about 20 grand. There's actually some advantages to it. We have, we're, we're, we're making good revenue right now. Um, and this will kind of reduce that loan balance a little quicker. Also keep the city happier, I'd imagine, right, Joe? I didn't say that one, you did. Okay. But I heard you out. <laughs> <laughs> because that's one of my concerns. We can talk offline on this, Joe, whenever you want. <laughs> Uh, you know, when I, when I enter a contract with somebody to open that contract back up, there's got to be a win-win. And I'm, you know, I appreciate what Al just said, and I'm not saying that's not important, but what's really in it for us? That's all. You don't have to answer that right now. My, we don't have to get into the debate. We can talk about that offline. I mean, my thought is, based on my Absolutely. conversations at, at BT, that you know the, the contract is silent. This didn't exist when we did the contract, and the whole intention is to get this thing paid off with a with a at a rate that we won't be able to. Well, no, everything rate. did exist when that contract was redone because Jerry and Bill and a few others were involved in that in order to be able for us to even pay anything because we didn't have any money. But we didn't have passes. the season. We didn't have the season passes. Correct. They were not part no. of it, but the barters and comps did exist, and they were yes. excluded. Specific. We did. We did speak to the city about that. They did exclude them at the time. Yes. I think the real issue is is the non is the season pass rounds. Right. Yep. Yeah, it's getting so a lot. Maybe one of the things that we asked for for doing that centers around degree of difficulty on for some people on season passes. That's all. But Joe, yeah, I, I, you know. I think that we need to have a good discussion on this offline. Michael, you can involve anybody you want, uh, obviously you're the chairman, um, before we make a final final on this. Right, and I think, I don't know if you have anything more before we get to preliminary discussion of rates, Mark, but it kind of ties into what we're gonna, what we're talking about. Do you have yeah. anything else or can we just dive into some? I'm done with my report. Okay. So one of the things, and, and I mentioned in the email, but. We'll be setting up a special meeting in December to go through uh, rates for 2022. And uh, just so we have a full month of everybody kind of understanding it, we just want to basic conversations. I mentioned this is not a real debate at this point. We're going to have plenty of time to talk about it, but I want to make sure everybody's got a kind of jump start on some things. So um, I know, Mark, you would, I, I was very interested in the season passes and you put together a really good report. Are you going to be able to pull that up and just click through it? We'll try to go as quickly as possible because we still got to get to the executive session. Yeah. Um, let's see. Okay. So if you want for the, in the interest of time, since I've already sent this around, instead of me sitting here and basically rereading everything, do you want to just kind of jump in and have me touch on a few things? If you could just go down to the, the summary of, of what the net actual kind of profit was, I was interested in that. It was the 2.3%. Yeah, that. that. Yeah. So um, I, I took all the members, uh, all the season pass members, uh, uh, put down all of their actual rounds played, got a, got a rate per round for each player, compared it to what they would have paid if they'd just gone and gotten a discounted D card and then played discounted rounds. Uh, so in other words, if, if the season passes did not exist, 
And I was, I was uh, honestly surprised that we were at the bottom here, you'll see, we were 2.3% or $3,500, we made more uh, than if we, they had just gotten ID cards. Now, just it's, it's somewhat minor, but this was only for through November 4th. So that still leaves about seven weeks, eight weeks left of play. Mind you, it's minimal play at this point, but I would gather that if I did this analysis again on January 1st, we'd probably break even or be even a couple bucks under. So it, it, it's only a couple thousand dollars here. So uh, the fact that we had guaranteed money up front, which to me is the biggest benefit for us as a company, um, in case there was bad weather, uh, in case players were not able to play for any any particular reason, um, I feel that uh, my, my mindset has turned around. And uh, at least for me personally, I feel that this is something I would like to stick with. Uh, and I would maybe consider uh, increasing uh, just just five to 10 percent. Uh, limit limit them to uh, Paul and I've had uh, many conversations on this. We we you know we we don't want there to be too many of these taking up all of the tea times early, and that's what will happen. So we want to this year we had 66, but really 75 players after after the the families are in there. So if we can limit it somehow, whether we do that by pricing more people out or we just uh, uh, we stop at 50, which just so everyone's aware, um, the. the if these are open, like on, on, on our online store, we can go to sleep on Thursday with 48 sold and come in the next day, theoretically, with seven people having purchased them. So we would have 55. So just to throw it on the table, we would not necessarily be able to stop exactly at 50, but I think we'd have to be okay with saying, okay, it, it'll stop somewhere in the 50s, 53, 54, 55, if that happens. Yeah, I like, I like the way you phrase that other than price people out. Yeah. And I know, I, know what your meaning, I know what your meaning was, but I know how those things can get interpreted. Question oh, for okay. you, Mark. Do, did the 2.3%, uh, I think it was, did yep. that include carts? Or is no. that, that's not no, even this, so. This is green fees only. So the people that play carts, all the extra rounds they play, that's a little bit of a bonus too. Yeah, but and Paul, if you want to jump in here, Paul said that he, he uh, uh, based on, on the, the people that he's looking at, he thinks the bulk of them, and I think Paul, I think you and Bennett may have done a quick, quick analysis of it, uh, that it's a lot less than you might think. They're mostly walkers. Right. And I know we were interested in, did they bring many guests? We looked at the tea sheet a lot recently and we're gonna do some more, but they didn't really bring a lot of guests. And I would say, I'm guessing we probably have 60% carts, 40% walkers, but a third of those walkers um, I mean, they, they just don't take many cards, our annual pass holders. They're all, they're all walking. Yeah, no, I, these, this is very interesting analysis. It's different than I thought it was going to be. Um, I'll, I'll hold off on giving any opinion on it yet, but, um, I just want to make sure the entire authority had some time to digest it. Basically what I'd like to come in when we do the vote um is just have everybody an understanding of the pros and the cons there are clear pros to this program at the ones that mark stated right we're getting that influx of cash when we normally are getting very very little revenue it is guaranteed money um the downside you know the cons are some of the ones that we mentioned we do on the risk of actually netting less money um there are there is some frustration from some golfers that uh you know the season pass holders all get the best tee times so we have to weigh the pros and the cons that's kind of that. That's what I would ask the authority to think about. I, like I said, I don't want to get into a huge debate here, but I, we have some time, and um, we'll be scheduling that. That meeting, when we do the rates, I believe we're going to have a live meeting. We're trying to figure out if we can do it as a hybrid model, right, Mark? But that one, yeah, I do think we're going to try to do it live. Yeah, I have to work with the city because they said that the community room was not available that, that day, um, and and they had to they have to figure out how to do the hybrid. Uh, it should be possible, and we may have to squeeze into a smaller room, um, but maybe not everyone will be there. Maybe some people will come in uh, virtually, so probably shouldn't be an issue. Council, maybe, maybe Chambers, Council Chambers. Fixed, Council Chambers is wired to do that right now, to have uh, a meeting okay. and, and also do a hybrid. Uh, I'll mention that to, uh, to Zalma at the city. Okay. Can we do it at the restaurant? Yeah, mm -hmm. it would be amazing to do it at the restaurant. We could just set a camera up and, yeah. uh, you know. Us. I can yeah. get. I got a little projector screen. We could put it up there, and that would be ideal. Would, long, no detriment to your technical abilities, and I'm sure because you do 
these kind of things all the time, just as long as it works. Uh, Carl, you want it to work? Here. I didn't say it was going to work. I, just I know. I mean, what screen. a stupid thing to ask for is to have a meeting with the entire city invited and, and not work. No. Well, but, that being said, we want to have a live aspect to it for sure. Um, because this will, we usually do get a ton of feedback and it's rightly so. And I want to make it as transparent as possible. So, um, and that's the only public meeting through the year that people really attend. Right. Right. Um, okay. Yeah. I, I have one other, I have one other final question request, Mark, to you. Um, the last finance meeting that I attended, they got into, uh the season passes and where's the revenue and yada 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 and you know they were saying we were doing a good job and yeah yeah and i said yeah in fact you know we haven't had to draw on the line of credit and there's a good possibility we're not going to have to who knows where whatever but you, you did this kind of on the envelope last time i asked you for it but i think no matter who goes before the finance committee the next time around um if how much can you and i know this is pulling out your crystal ball here how much do you think before we open up the course and everything for the start of next year that we would still have available to us if needed in the line of credit or how much would we take out before that occurs i mean there's some fixed cost that you could look at so that's salaries this or that and other things but, you know, just well, some with, degree with, of comfort. With, well, with 600 plus thousand dollars in the bank, uh, we, we won't need to touch that. If you're talking specific about the line of credit, we will not need to dip into that, even if we pay for the, the full card path paving. Um, so that won't be an issue. So we would still have the $200,000 in case we decided to, for whatever reason, uh, uh, finance uh, another big project. Well, I'm glad you said that because that's what I told him. And I said, any differences has to be made up, Paul, and make up the difference. There you go. <laughs> the, the, uh, the only other question, I'll leave it up to, the, and we can move on. Does anybody on the authority uh, need any more information? I think this is so great what you put together, Mark. But is there any other things that would help make your decision? Um, you don't have to answer that now, but just shoot Mark or my, and myself and Joe and Carl a note and say, hey, I would be curious about X. And if it's something like, you know, the anecdotal evidence about people walking and things like that, that's all important. So just yeah. think of those type of things. I think this is pretty comprehensive, but if there's anything else. Yeah, the, the last thing I'd like to know about this is effectively with the average rate per round or revenue per round for season passes being effectively equal to the rate per round of a regular greens fee round. What's happening here is, you know, there's <clears throat> a, a kind of a, a, a premium being paid, a, a discount per round, but then a premium that's kind of equal to that for the one day advanced booking. Right. That's the way we should really think about it. We shouldn't think that there's no discount being put here because there's a big value that people get out of that one day advanced booking to the chagrin of some other people. Right. So there must be some value there. Yep. So that's kind of the way to think about that. Nevertheless, with that extra value proposition that we put into this product, we are coming back to an even number per round. One of the reasons, one of the inputs, as people think about it, that you know the the argument for not paying the city the regular rate per season pass round kind of falls apart, right? If if you're actually getting generally the same amount of value per round there, you don't really have a a, a solid reason not to. I mean, I, I think this this does kind of change the calculus on the discount that we were expecting to have paid, even with the extra do, do, uh, value proposition. I yeah. thought it was a much deeper discount. It was when we initially did the product with a lower price point. But since we right size the price point, I think it's pretty much right on. Maybe there's a regular kind of increase to keep up with the regular greens fees increase um, for the next year. But, I, you know, I think we're pretty much there. Yeah. 
Uh, speaking of, and it's kind of close, but it's a kind of tangential point. Um, do, do we have information on what the management's thinking is on the regular greens fees and carts and all that? Increase them. Well, uh, Paul and Don, you guys want to handle that? I would say, you know, last year we increased uh, the ID cards a little bit and we didn't increase much for the seniors or juniors. Um, you know, we're gonna go to $80 for the non-resident. I don't see we can go much more than that until we do some more work maybe on the, on the course itself and some of the facilities there. But um, I think we should remember that minimum wage is gonna go up. Uh, demand for tea times is going up. We have inflation, we have cost of goods going up. And uh, we have a number of improvements being made at Oak Hills. So I think, you know, if we increase things, you know, a dollar here and maybe $2 there, I don't think people would be upset with that as long as we can keep making improvements. And I think a lot of people know it's, it's a valid increase considering what's going on in the world today. Yeah. And whereas uh, many okay. companies, you know, they all, everyone increased um, costs during the year, we, we haven't done any of that. And we, we get to do it maybe once a year. Yeah, right. Uh, well, we can do it as often as we want. We just have to have a public hearing every time we do it, right? Yeah. Um, so we kind of restrict it to once a year. So, uh, but it sounds like what you're thinking generally is kind of keep up with the expenses of maintaining the course, minimum wage increases, those sorts of things, but nothing nothing super yeah. drastic or no structural changes to the, 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 um, the rate card. So can we kind of look at that the same way that uh, some of the rules and regulations that we work under, like there's a, one of those documents about how pricing of food at the golf course has to be comparable to, what, I don't know how many miles it is around the course. Could we do that by looking at uh, golf courses within, I don't know, 20, 30 miles of us? what their rates are, and I'm talking about individual tee times now, not season passes and stuff, and just get an idea, are we kind of in the ballpark? Are we more expensive? Maybe we're not charging enough? Something I was going like to ask the same thing. I was going to say the same thing, Carl. I think Mark, Mark I think and I and Paul looked at it the other day. We were sat down and kind of compared it to Sterling. Um, but Sterling's kind of a different animal because they can offset their pricing a little bit because of the, the driving range. Right, they they taking a lot of extra yeah, revenue. But they they operate under the same kind of charter uh, that we do as far as a advisory committee goes. And you're right, because that brings in about a million two a year in revenue that drives. Right. So uh, I mean, I, I think the argument for raising prices is an easy one. I think Paul touched on it. Uh, you know, you got minimum wage, you got you got money that's going into the course. As long as the course is showing improvement and you're and you're showing these incremental changes. New I think restaurant. The I think the argument to people is an easy one. And you say, listen, we have no choice but to raise costs or raise prices because our costs are up. I mean, everybody knows inflation's here. Everybody knows the minimum wage increases are here. I mean, $15 minimum wage is going to be the law in this land in the next year or two, I think. I think $15 kicks in 2023. Right. Yeah, so. we've been slowly bringing it up. Yeah, I mean, what I would ask is, you know, just exactly that. If there's a rate increase, just some backup as to where that comes from. I think a lot of it's just very logical, right? Inflation's up. We put more, just, I want to just spelled out, you know, so that when we have the public there, we could point to that. And then also it would be good to just have, and we don't have to, you know, dollars for dollars with other courses around, but get a general sense, as Jennifer said, all right, where do we compare? Because um, we don't necessarily want to be the cheapest because we've got a great product, you know, so. Yep. Uh, we want to keep it a great product. We got to make sure that we can you know, have some hand. So uh, that would be my only ask. And we don't, you know, this isn't the full debate here. It's just leading right. up to that meeting. So I could, if I could just add one thing, looking at the rounds, like two thirds of our rounds come from um, non-residents of Norwalk, you know, out of towners. And, right. and, and I think basically, you know, politically, it would be almost great to keep, you know, rates pretty low for the for the residents and the resident seniors, the people that pay the taxes to Norwalk. The people are out of town. They're coming to us for a reason. Those are the guys we should go after. If you're going to whack someone up, those are the people I think that should be paying more because they're not residents of Norwalk. And plus, if you're playing around New York City or Westchester, you're paying an arm and a leg anyway to play golf on courses that aren't anywhere near as nice. The public courses there. That's who I'd go after. 
Yeah, right. I, I'd be kind, yeah, I'd be kind to the Norwalk and the seniors and yep. work on the non-residents. Yep. And, as far, and, and as, as far as golf fees go, you, you definitely have to look at the proximity in, to New York City because the further you get from the city, uh, yeah. the less expensive things get. Right, right. Yep. I just wanted to touch... I just want to touch on Joe's question from before, though, about this, th is the structure of this going to change? Uh, Paul, I know you've, you've mentioned to me, you were thinking about maybe getting rid of Twilight or, or kind of combining off-peak and Twilight. And no, it, maybe there's no, something. No, we only did that for for the end of November here, but. Just an off-season? Okay. Yeah, only because the, 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 the clocks have gone back and the sun's setting so early. Right. Okay. It's getting late, guys. It's getting late. Uh, exactly. I'm That's with Joe Villa. Um, all right, so we, we, we thank you for all the information. We'll, we'll be setting up that meeting. Uh, and we'll figure out what kind of hybrid scenario we can have. Uh, the next thing is uh, increasing the fiscal year capital improvements budget. Mark, you wanna? Uh, I don't well, think I'm leading that up. Well, we were- <laughs> I'm, against, I'm, I'm against that, so. Okay, well, because well, I guess the question is this, this was, put on there because we talked at the last meeting about um, increasing the cost, the, the construction cost for the kitchen at uh, what is now Jim's house um, to, and you know, from 18,000 and the quote came in around $26,000. So um, my, I, I, my question to you, Mark, was I know you had said we don't necessarily, we might not necessarily have to do a full vote on it. That's what I was yeah. asking. So, because it's, we could move money around. Yeah, I like the idea of moving money around. I just I, I printed out real quick the um, uh, the the capital projects budget by by area that some of us have already seen. You know, Jim has eighteen thousand six hundred in there ready for this year. So if he comes back and says it's going to be thirty grand, we have to find twelve. And you know, we had extra in there for the car path uh, overage. We have stuff in there for uh, the rental house and so forth. So. Uh, if we can, before we finalize anything, I just want to see if, if I think offline we have a meeting. I know Alan has already offered to uh, to jump in. Uh, I think we have a staff meeting with with some, maybe the executive committee call it and and we go through and we, we we just move stuff around and see if we can come to the same amount for the year. Yep. So just so yeah, everybody's everybody's aware, the the, the new quote that came in is twenty six thousand four hundred dollars. So it's roughly ten thousand dollar increase. Now, the way I view this is, you know, we, we talk about it as Jim's house, but this isn't Jim's house. This is an asset that we have. So I'm thinking of it as a, hey, look, I, I redid my kitchen. This is a great cost for a kitchen uh, redo. And so, you know, I, the, the fear I have is you look at kind of what happened with the rental property and that property is in tough shape. If we have the ability to go in there, we're going to be doing work there anyway. I would prefer to do it right because I would say, and I'm not speaking towards, you know, I wasn't on previous authorities, but I feel like one of the things that's gotten us in trouble is kind of putting band-aids on and not doing things when we doing them right. So my feeling is, yes, we should increase this budget, get the kitchen, because this will be an asset that the park owns for the next hundred years or whatever that is. And if you want to increase the value of your house, kitchens and bathrooms and added bedrooms, that's what you do, right? So, um, but I wanted to get everybody's input on that, whether we have to go for an increase or whether we can can move the money around, we could figure that out, that out once we get the buy-in from the authority. So, does anybody have any thoughts about the the idea of increasing the budget for this kitchen project, an additional ten thousand? Yeah, the capital expense budget is set as a at a specific number, yep. and not as a compendium of individual product projects that right. are set to a specific number. This overage is not putting us over that number at this point, right? It would be very mm -hmm. difficult to do that three, four months into the fiscal year. And so there's nothing to vote on, right? If, if I, I guess if we just kind of all agree that this is a decent price for a kitchen right now, and we should do that, knowing kind of the, the rest of the landscape of how capital projects are coming in, if we get to the point eventually later in the fiscal year where we are scratching at the top of that capital expense budget, then we would have to, I suppose, vote to go over by a significant amount. I think going over a budget is kind of, it happens, you go under a budget too. But if it was gonna be a significant amount at that point, we would have to kind of authorize that. But right now, there's no threat of that happening. So I'm not sure why we would vote to do anything here. We could, we could vote on anything, but 
right yeah, now right. there's nothing to vote on. We got 40,000 in golf simulators in the budget, okay? So I think it uh, be uh, 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 uh. there's no? also forty thousand dollars of revenue on the top line. So if that that forty thousand is not transferable. It, that's me. That's it's a zero effect. So the not on budget, the table. <laughs> well, here's how I look at it. We have X amount of dollars, and we've already allocated out the dollars, right, based on what we think we're going to spend it. So we should re look at what we're look at what we're looking to spend reallocate the dollars like for like a revised projection perspective so we remember what we did mm -hmm. and then come up you know give um this project the additional 10 grand that it needs sure great agreed right at least we know where we pulled it from like you know taking from peter to give it to paul so we kind of in case we all end up with like i like to call genesia and i forget what we did yeah <laughs> Well, that's exactly why I wanted to have this discussion, because I also didn't I want it to be in March. Well, hey, what, where do we do this? Oh, you right. know, we just move some money around. I wanted the entire authority to see it and be on board with it. I think seems pretty straightforward. But I don't want to speak for anybody. Um, I, we don't need a full vote on it because we're not increasing it. But I did want it to, you know, again, just completely transparent. I think it's a really good project to to move money towards. Yeah. And real quick, I, I think I already I think I've already mentioned it, Mike, that I, I had sent Alan a, uh, just I started doing a quick little, uh, uh, you know, updated version of what we had done. So I think if we all sit down together at, at a staff meeting one day on a random day, uh, we go through and we kind of hash it out and, and, and figure this out. I think it'll make a lot of sense. Yep, I agree. Well, I agree uh, with you, Michael, about the fact that, you know, we have half a everything we've had to do because we didn't have any money. Right. But now's the time to do it and do it the right way. And then again, of course, you know, Joe, if we don't pay the city an additional twenty thousand uh, dollars, we might have some money there. Nice one, Joe. That, that's blue blue money versus orange money. That, that's that's an invalid comment. No, no, no. <laughs> um, all right. So I don't think we need any more discussion on this. I think since anybody has anything to add, but I could forward everybody the quote. It's a very straightforward quote. There's nothing, you know, he's not getting gold plated cabinets or anything. So, so the, um, the, or sorry, Mike, the, the number you gave was the first quote. The second quote was actually, I don't know, 440 bucks less for a change in the, in what was being done. Good. Sure. But these, right. and we should remember, right? Like, what would we be authorizing? These are quotes, right? You go in and you've to a construction project and you come up with the reality. It could be less, it could be more. Mm -hmm. Right. Yep, absolutely. So but I think it's just a deployment of the CapEx um, uh, budget. And, you know, as things change, we'll trim our sales or, you know, find other things to do if we have extra money. Well, now would be the time before the cost of everything keeps going up the way it is. Right. Yeah. No, and it's supply, not going to go down. Being able, to, being able to even get material. Right. Right. Um, okay. So if we're good there, are we ready to go into executive session? Should Do be a short, very yeah. short. Hey, Mike. Mm -hmm. uh, it looks like Peter had a question in the Q and A section. I know we touched on it, but I just didn't know if you wanted to, um, if we just wanted to publicly acknowledge it. I can can I say I saw it, and I and and Mike saw it. So okay. The only reason I'll say this, and it's just procedural, but there's a public per policy. There's a public comment section. Yeah. And then once that public comment is closed, so even though we're virtual, this would be essentially like stopping a meeting in the middle of a public meeting yep. and addressing questions. So okay. I, I, I answered them. I'm going to, I told them I'll call them offline. And I think we have the answer to the question, but I, if we start to just take questions mid meeting, this could be a, you know, a problem. We would, we yes. would never end these meetings. Yep. Yes. No, that's fine. I just wanted to make sure, cause nope. I know that we had issues with him in the beginning. Yeah, no. And I followed, and that's why I was able, and I answered them and, brought it up um but i will uh i will definitely follow up with them right after this um so it looks like we have to go in executive session and then come out of executive session to adjourn correct or am i wrong on that who's the, no, the that's policy right. there's person? two different links that's right but can so we yeah okay so we have we have to make a motion right now to actually go into executive session she's right right 
And then we could jump in that. So Anthony, I think just resent the link. I, everybody has the link to the executive session, right? This should be honestly very, very quick. It's just informational. Anthony just resent it. Not, not, not the staff, none of us, Jim, no. Paul, Don, we're, we're not going to this. No, no. we were dismissed. Unless you want to okay. hang out mm. for adjournment. Thank Go you guys. Ahead. All right, Good night, guys. guys. Good night. Appreciate it. All right, so we're going to jump into that executive session. Um, and then we'll, when we come out, we'll come back in here for adjournment. All right. We have, uh, Mike, we have to make the motion first to go into right. executive. You want to make the motion? Go ahead. I'll make, me. I'll make the motion that Second. we go into executive session. <laughs> Seconded by Joe. Okay. We'll see you in 30 seconds. Okay. Five people. We, we... Thank you. So it is uh, 9 05. We are coming out of executive session. Mr. Andrasco, do you have anything to add? Motion to adjourn. Second. Second. All right, guys. Second. Thank you. Have a great evening. Cheers. Good meeting. Right. Thank you. Right. Bye, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.